Great, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I wanted to give a couple quick updates from two major recent field expeditions, namely IODP 357 that drilled a series of boreholes into the Atlantis Massif, and then a recent ROV expedition to the Lost City hydrothermal field itself where we got to collect some fluids. And just to remind everyone, uh, Lost City has been mentioned a couple times today, but we're sitting here on top of a detachment fault and there's fluids that are venting um, in a focused flow um, out through these large carbonate brucite chimneys. And going into these expeditions, we had some ideas of what was happening with carbon along the fluid reaction pathway. And namely that we have seawater that's starting out in the, in the deep sea um, with dissolved inorganic carbon, about two millimolar, and it carries with it dissolved organic carbon. Um, and as that downwells, we know from looking at the fluids, both at Lost City, but then a lot of analogous places such as Oman, that you basically remove almost all of the dissolved inorganic carbon, mostly as calcium carbonate in the subsurface. Uh, we know as this, these fluids migrate through the system and come to depth and are heated, we know that there's some degree of mantle input, at least at Lost City. We can see that in the helium isotopes. We know that if there's a mantle input, there must be a mantle CO2 input. Um, that does not actually make it up into the chimneys as far as we can tell, because instead you have the result or you have the impact of these serpentinization reactions that are forming, among other things, hydrogen. And that goes on to potentially form methane, either uh, so possibly not along this fluid pathway, but rather that formed at higher temperatures was trapped in fluid inclusions and then is being stripped um, as these new fluids are going through those same reacted rocks. From previous work that we've done, we also have um, a lot of evidence that you have things like small organic acids, such as formate, that are formed abiotically from this mantle CO2 and carried with those fluids. Uh, as they then go into the chimneys. And so the opportunity with um, 357 is that we could drill into these rocks and look at some of these processes directly in the subsurface. And one of the uh, things that we were able to do on 357 is look at what we're calling liner fluids. And this is kind of the rocky equivalent of sedimentary pore fluids. And so it's the water that um, is in interaction with the rock. In this type of, we were using seabed rock drills, and in that type of drilling, you're using uh, deep seawater as your drilling fluid. And so you have this combination of, uh, in these liner fluids of basically deep seawater and what was, uh, what, and the water that was in the subsurface itself. And so if we look at some of the organic acids, for example, in the subsurface um, of the Atlantis Massif, this is a plot versus depth. Um, and so up at the surface down to about, we got down to about 16 meters, and you have formate concentrations on the left and acetate concentrations on the right. And in these gray bars are the range of concentrations that we see coming out of the chimneys when we sampled them in 2003. And what you see from this is that even though we had very high concentrations of formate in fluids coming from the Lost City, uh, the Lost City chimneys, there is much lower concentrations in the subsurface. And you have the opposite with acetate, where you have relatively low concentrations coming out of the chimneys, but you get up to hundreds of micromoles um, in many different samples in the rocky subsurface. And one of these samples had up to two millimole acetate. And if you do the math on that, acetate has two carbons. So that means there's about four millimole of carbon that's um, present in those fluids. Since you're starting, um, since the fluids that are coming down come down with about two millimole carbon, um, you must be having an, a uh, contribution of carbon from other locations, something like uh, either remobilizing previously uh, deposited carbon or inputs from something like, um, like mantle CO2. 
the interesting, what I found really interesting about this data is that we could then go and look at where you see these organic acids, and the acetate to me was the most interesting part of this because it's very high concentrations, and we could look at where we see those high concentrations compared to the rock types that they were, that were recovered with those liner fluids. And so when you do that, what you see is that most of the very high acetate concentrations are associated with uh, serpentinized hardspergite and metadolorites, as opposed to um, some of the basaltic type of, um, type of material. We also looked at hydrolyzable amino acids in these liner fluids, and again, you have um, hydrolyzable amino acids uh, going down through depth, and you get up to some relatively high concentrations. Well, for seawater type systems, these are very high concentrations. Um, and this is, these amino acids um, we know are microbially produced. We did DL ratios on them, and so they have a very clear microbial signature. Um, and so this is an indication, potentially, of where life is in the subsurface. Um, and so, again, we can look at that in comparison with where, with what type of rock they were associated with when they were recovered. And um, in this case, we see the highest amino acids associated with serpentinized Hartzbergite rubble as opposed to the in, more intact serpentinized Hartzbergite. And again, this is um, a little bit different than where we see the really high acetate. And so this might be starting to tell us something about where you have uh, different types of reactions and different type of carbon rock reactions in different parts of the system as you have fluids that are passing through. Um, and so that's the IODP side of things. Uh, a few years after that, we were able to go to the Lost City field itself and sample some of the fluids that are coming out of the carbonate chimneys. And um, one of the big things that we were able to do during that expedition, uh, in part thanks to DCO and its support of a new sampler um, that was able to collect very large volumes of very clean um, water, is analyze those fluids for dissolved organic carbon, um, the C14 content of dissolved organic carbon. And so C14 of DOC is a very powerful indicator um, because it's, it's reflecting this, the different potential sources of carbon. And so in the deep sea, you basically have modern carbon in the form of dissolved inorganic carbon. You have dissolved organic carbon of deep seawater that tends to have an F14 signature of about 0.6 or 0.7 that is associated with a C14 age of about 4,000 years in the Atlantic. As you have the circulation pathway of the ocean, it ages to about 6,000 years. Um, and, and what the DOC community has wondered for a long time is how to reconcile the fact that you have this pool of organic matter that's cycling through the ocean four to six times um, over and over again and is, must be relatively refractory and relatively slow to react. If you compare that with some of the concentrations in F14C ages of dissolved organic carbon collected from the Lost City field, what you see is that there's basically no radiocarbon left in that DOC pool. Um, and that concentrations are, go from about similar to seawater to uh, substantially higher than seawater. So you could explain that data in one of two ways. One, the kind of first explanation would be to say that you have um, aging of organic carbon along that fluid pathway, and you have some addition of organic carbon that's contributed on top of some seawater, aged seawater signature. Um, and so if you try and uh, go with that explanation, you can calculate how long it takes for C14 to decay, and it would, it would require a circulation time of about 20,000 years. Um, we know from some independent data looking at radium isotopes that are coming out of these fluids that the circulation pathway of fluids from the point of downwelling to the point of exiting through a chimney is more on the order of about 10 years. And so you can't really attribute this, um, these C14 ages to a mechanism 
such as um, aging and addition. The other uh, argument that would support this is that I have here in parentheses the C13 ages of the same dissolved organic carbon pool. Seawater is pretty uniform. Seawater has a pretty uniform DOC C13 value of about minus 21 to minus 23, no matter where you are in the ocean. Um, and what you see is that coming out of Lost City, you have DOC that has C13 values ranging from about minus six to minus three per mil. And so again, if you were simply aging this seawater, you can't get to a C13 value of about minus three um, just, by, just via aging. And so um, if you compare, if you add onto this graph all the C14 DOC data that exists from hydrothermal systems globally, um, what, you, what you'll notice is that you actually, that this, this signature um, is that there's a tendency when, oce when ocean water goes into the subsurface that you're removing dissolved organic carbon. It's a signature that we've seen for a good 10 years now. And that C14 age tends to become um, older and older and older. And so these are data from basalt hosted systems um, in North Pond on the Juan de Fuca Ridge. And what I would argue is that in order to get data that's down here at C14 ages of zero, close to zero, um, is that you have to have a complete removal of oceanic DOC that's, that's being carried into the system. You have to remove all that, and then you can add back in um, some organic matter that has a very different isotopic signature. And that organic matter is, uh, both has a C13, that's somewhere around minus three, minus six, um, but it is also, uh, it, it's being formed from probably mantle carbon um, or possibly something like carbonate that was deposited um, more than 50,000 years ago. And so when I saw this data, you have to now explain, let me go back for just a second, you have to explain how you removed all this organic carbon in the first place. And um, one possibility is that you have sorption of organic matter to things like iron. You've seen a lot of talks um, about things like serpentinites, and you know that there's this very important interaction between carbon and iron, and that's something that, again, these are uh, just a very small number of, of examples, um, starting in the soil literature, but then also experimental um, examples, where you have this very strong interaction between um, organic carbon and iron. And the higher iron content that minerals have, that sediments have, that soils have, um, the more organic carbon ends up being associated with it. And that tends to be true in particular in anoxic systems. And so when I first saw this data, um, one of the questions that I had was whether or not this could potentially be an indication that you have a lot of sorption in order to remove that organic carbon from seawater um, into the crust. And so Gretchen Frugreen and her group have measured TOC in the rocks that we recovered from the Atlantis Massif. And um, the TOC of those rocks, the to total organic carbon of those rocks, tend to be in this kind of marine realm of about minus 25 per mil. So again, that might be indicating that this organic matter is coming in part from these surficial processes. Um, and, and again, we've seen this close interaction of carbon and iron um, in some of these really amazing um, high resolution imaging experiments. And so part of my question is whether or not some of this could be due, some portion of this signature could be due to the sorption of things like dissolved organic carbon that's coming, that's being brought with this downwelling seawater and being sorbed onto iron minerals as it passes through the, through the system. Um, we also, there's, there's clearly the extra question then of what this extra additional 70 micromole of DOC is as you um, are now coming back up. And just one answer is that some of it is clearly um, organic acids. So this is N-member formate concentrations versus hydrogen. Um, and there does seem to be a metastable equilibrium that's occurring there, which is um, something that I've talked about in the past and Jill McDermott has shown in other systems. 
um, that you have this, this formation of formate, particularly where you have higher hydrogen concentrations. But this high acetate that we see in the subsurface does not make it up into the fluids that then get exported into the deep sea. Um, and so the, the kind of carbon cycling diagram that we would have is this loss of seawater, DIC and DOC, and then additions of things like formate and methane. Um, so I am out of time, but I just wanted to say thank you to all the people who have participated um, in this work. It was an enormous effort and all the funding agencies that supported us along the way.